God who sees us. You are the God who heals us. You are the God who cares. There is no God beside you, period. And we thank you for your goodness to our lives. Not only are you the universal Lord and Master, you are the God of every individual believer. And we thank you for that. Bless those who have been mentioned for prayer tonight. I pray that you would be the physical healing that people need, the safety on the road. Thank you for your goodness to us in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter number 3 tells a story of the call of Moses. And Israel had been, they weren't Israel at this time, but the Jews had been locked up in Egypt for centuries. And apparently they didn't know who God was. Uh, they'd become Egyptianized pretty much. And so the Lord calls Moses and Look at verse 13 in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say, What's his name? Which is a Semitic way of saying, What kind of God is this? Exodus 3, beginning, we're in verse 13. Exodus, Exodus 3, 13. All right, so what kind of a God are you? They're, they're going to ask me because how many gods did Egypt have? You know, they had, they were, they were multi, multi. I mean, they had a God for everything. They had a God for wheat and a God for corn, a God for water, a God for rain, a God for the sun. A God, I mean, they had all these gods. And so the Jews are going to ask, and Moses anticipated this question, um, what kind of a God is this? He says now, verse number 14, God, and, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Okay? Which means basically, some of these words we have lost the definition of, okay? But this one basically is, I am Yahweh who is. Now, this is his personal name. What we're going to be looking at tonight is the personal name of God. This is not a moniker. This is not, and I used the term last week, and I hope you understand what I, what I meant by a nickname. Um, you know, Hagar called him the God who sees me. Well, not everybody said that. That, was, that identified her personal experience. So what, how we could do that today would be like, um, you know, Lorraine could pray, this is the God who got us to Oklahoma and back. This is the guy, well, not everybody went to Oklahoma and got back safely. And so that would be a peculiar name that you could call God. And that's kind of what the, these names were about. This is the Lord that, uh, that does this or that does that. But this is his personal name. For instance, if I said Mr. Paul Sutton, is Mr. his name? That's his title. Paul is his personal name. And so when we talk about the Lord, what, what is his personal name? If you were in a conversation with him, would you say, Oh, God who sees me. Well, you could. Or you could use his name. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And so, verse 14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, El Yeh, El Yeh Elohim, hath sent me unto you. All right, now let's stop right there. This lesson is going to center around this, the personal name of God. And this name appears more than 6,800 times in the Old Testament. It does not appear in the books of Esther, Ecclesiastes, or the Song of Solomon. This, his personal name does not appear in those three books. It is, it is the sacred name. And he revealed, he is the one that revealed this to me. And now, uh, Hagar named God. You know, you are the God who sees me. She came up with that name because of that particular incident. But this is the, when, when Moses said, what am I going to say to these people? He gave them. God gave them his personal name. This is his personal identification. And so he revealed this name to men. And so it was, again, it was the sacred personal name of God. And only the priests in the Old Testament, and even up to 70 A.D., only the priests would say this name. They would not even pronounce. It's called the Tetragrammaton. 
And tetragrammaton means the four letters. And I'll give you those four letters in a minute. But in the, in, in the tabernacle and in the temple, only the priests had access to this name and they would not even pronounce it because they were afraid they would mispronounce this name. And so they called him Adonai, which means Lord. And the word Adonai is a, it's a, what can I say? It's not a nickname. What's a, it's just a, an alternate name for Yahweh. All right, now we don't know how to pronounce this, okay? We do not know how to pronounce it. And uh, again, only the priest would speak it, and they wouldn't even speak it. They would substitute the name Adonai for the name Yahweh, if that's even the way it is pronounced. And uh, Yahweh is the name that is used very, that is very closely related to any redemptive act of God in the Old Testament, specifically concerning the Jews. And what that means is he is the God who redeems, he is the God who saves, he is the God who restores, he is the God who provides rescue for men from their captivity of sin. And so when you want to use the personal name of God that names God himself, what we're looking at tonight, the Tetragrammaton, is the name that you would use. And so again, the, the rabbinical priests were so afraid of even misspelling it. So you know what they would do in the transcripts of the Bible? When it came to this word, they would draw a blank. They would not even write it. It was too holy. It was too sacred a name. If they mispronounced it, they were afraid God would kill them. And so it was just one of those names that was pushed back uh, into Hebrew history. And in 70 AD, when Titus Vespasian came and destroyed the temple and just tore up Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem, that name, Yahweh, has not been used since then uh, because we've lost, we've lost how to pronounce it. We don't know how to pronounce it. And so this, this tetragrammaton is, in Hebrew, Hebrew has no vowels. It's a very difficult language. Um, it only has consonants, and consonants carry the primary meaning of any word or sentence. And uh, in, in any Semitic language, there are, in ancient Semitic languages, there were no vowels. It was just consonants. And so that's, there are some, in modern Hebrew, they have added some consonants because modern ways of speaking things. And uh, so Y-H-W-H, that is the tetragrammaton. How would you pronounce Y-H-W-H? We have no clue. We have no clue. Could it be Yahweh? It very well could be. It could be any number of uh, pronunciations. And um, the, the first appearance of the name Jehovah came in the 16th century when a gentleman by the name of William Tyndale, y'all have all heard of Tyndale's translations of the Bible, uh, he came across this word, Yahweh. And he basically designed a pronunciation for the English language and he coined it Jehovah. And that was in the 16th century. He was uh, translating the book of Exodus. And when he did that, he gave us Jehovah. Before then, it was whatever Y-H-W-H was pronounced as. And we have no clue. And, and so in English, we just call it Yahweh. And again, your, uh, Hebrew is a very guttural language. We don't, we don't speak this way, but they, they use a lot of, you know, it's like German. Uh, you know, the, when Germans speak German, they, there's a lot of guttural type pronunciation. But there's a place on earth, and this is where to me it just gets fascinating. There's a place on earth that bears this name of God. It's still in existence today. And it also, the very place contains a... 4,000-year-old prophecy just by the name of this place. And it is the place that is known as ha Makam. That means nothing to us in the English language, but it just simply means the place. Above all places on earth, this is the place. 
And it was given a very specific name back, well, Genesis 22. Let's go ahead and reveal this part to you. Uh, it was called YHVH, which now, there's a, a little different spelling of YHWH. And so let's just say Yahweh. Okay, so we'll just call it Yahweh. Yahweh Yira, Y-I-R-E-H. Yahweh Yira was what God was called, and that was the name of this place. And Yahweh is what we know to be the sacred, personal, intimate name of God. And the word, it, it, again, it's not a title. It's not Lord or Master or King or anything like that. Uh, and so we've got Yahweh. And the original idea of the Jewish priest, was they wouldn't pronounce the name Yahweh. They would say that great and terrible name. And everybody knew what they were talking about. So when it came to that part of the Bible, when they were reading the Old Testament, and they came to this word, Y-H-W-H, they would just say, y'all know that great and terrible name. And everybody would understand they were talking about the personal name of God. But now then there's this word, Yare, Y-I-R-E-H. And it means to make visible or to make to appear, to bring about, to reveal, and or to provide. Abraham gave this name to this particular place. And what would be made visible in this place? Well, in Genesis 22, there is the record of Abraham taking his son up into a mountain. Okay? And on the way up, Isaac is like, Dad, we've got the fire and the wood. We have everything but a sacrifice. And this is what Abraham said. Son, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. All right? The Lord, Yahweh, will yara himself. All right? Provide or to make arrangements for. And so that's, that's where the lamb was. And so in essence... The Hebrew says it this way. God will, Yahweh, the lamb, will provide, will reveal it. So what happened when they got up there? Um, Abraham didn't know this was going to happen. I, I, I'm positive of that. I know Isaac didn't know it. So he ties the boy up, puts him on this altar of stones, and he rocks his head back, and he takes his flint knife, now, can you imagine a father? And this is the boy that God promised. This is the, He loved this boy. He was committing suicide, basically, is what he was going to do here. And so he's about to drag that flint knife across that boy's throat, and the Lord stopped him. He said, stop. I did not want him. I wanted you. And in order to get you, I had to give you, I had to get you to offer him to me. And so he looked over, and there was a, a ram caught in the, the bushes over there. And... So, this is the name that identifies the place, Jehovah Yireh, and it means the place that the lamb was provided, okay? Now, you say, well, that's, that's cool. Um, where is the, this place is still in existence today? And it is. Um, it's called Mount Moriah. This is the very same mountain where Jesus was crucified about 2,500 years later. So, this was not only the name of the place, but it was a prophecy. What, what is the prophecy? In this very place, the Lord will yare the lamb. He will provide the lamb. Not, all, not only did he do it with an animal, but he did it with his own son. And so, well, what does, what does Moriah mean? See, these word, words mean things. And I love cracking these things open and see well, what, what kind of flavor, what kind of aroma. Uh, do you remember in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, uh, 20 through 22 uh, do you remember what the young lady says? Somebody turn there and read in Ruth, chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. Whoever gets it, read it. You got it? Okay. Call 
call me what? Mara. Guess what that's kin to? Mariah. So she said, don't call me by my name anymore. Call me bitterness. Because the Lord has dealt bitterly because she went out. She lost her husband. She lost her boy. She lost, I mean, you know, she, she had, a, had a bad, bad situation. And so she comes back and says, just call me bitterness. Mara is kin to Moriah. So um, what does Mount Moriah have to do with the presentation of a lamb and God providing a lamb? It was on this very same place that the seminal event of human history took place. This is where Christ offered himself. This is where the, this is where the Lord provided himself. I mean, literally provided himself, volunteered himself, gave himself, presented himself, revealed himself, whatever kind of word that you want to use. It is in that family of words that means the same thing. And it is here that God sent his son to be the spiritual finances for the salvation of mankind. S same exact spot. It was also in this same exact spot where the temple would be built. Several thousands of years after Abraham offered his son Isaac, and it was, it was the same spot. So there's something very special, very seminal about this place that the Lord has designated and revealed the Lamb to us about. And uh, so it just simply means the place where God provided for our salvation. Now, has God provided for every need we have. Has God done that? He has. What need do we have that God has not made provision for? Physical needs. Um, food, water, air, health, uh, financial needs. Look at, I mean, just look. Wherever you turn, there's a provision. Now, if you will notice, you look at a map of the world, the 1040 window, 10 degrees north of the equator, 40 degrees north of the equator, there's a, there's a strip of land where a huge, huge majority of people in the world live. And it, it covers northern Africa and it, all of those nations. Basically, it is the womb of false religion. It is where all of this stuff has been birthed. It is where the Bible has been rejected. It is where Christ has been ignored. It is also the place where there's more poverty. There's more sickness. There's more crime in the 1040 window than any other place on earth. You think that's coincidental? That where there is a vacuum of biblical morality? Look at, look at the aberrant morality that fills that vacuum. Same thing that's going on here in this country, as a matter of fact. And so, uh, Messiah is the Lamb. He is the provision. John one twenty nine, John says, Jesus is walking down the banks of the Jordan River. You remember what he said? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, takes away, removes, absolves, adjudicates the sin of the world. And... We said, well, why? And people, and I've talked to people through the course of the years, and, and they will say stuff like, I've never killed anybody. I've never this, and I've never that. And they will give you a list of things that they find almost unforgivable, that they're not guilty of. And I, I think we're, we're a funny species. Um, I feel good about myself because I don't sin the same way you do. So your sin is always worse than mine. Mine is okay. That's, that's the way we look at people. And uh, so, you know, this, we have, when did we become sinners? Now, in human systems of, of jurisprudence, when does a person become a felon? Is it when he commits a felony? No, when he commits a felony. All right, it, you, you, you're a criminal when you commit a crime. What if you don't commit a crime? Are we criminals in here? Are any any felons in here? Getting mighty quiet. <laughs> There's not a felon in this building. Why? Why are there no felons in the building? 
We have not committed a felony. That's exactly right. So, and that's the way people look at God's system of jurisprudence. Well, I have never, da, 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 but that's not how God calculates the moral character of people. We are felons by nature, and that's what people cannot understand. By nature? What do you mean by nature? Our very species, the very DNA of a human being, is in violation of God's purpose for life. And people just find that hard to believe. Well, I'm a nice guy. I go to church. I this and I that. I'm aware of that. But you cannot tame the flesh. Now, we can tame uh, killer whales. You know, you can tame a tiger or a lion. You, can't, you cannot tame the human heart. And so, uh, in, we, are, we are this incredibly defiled species. And we are, we're criminals before God. And so the Lord has provided a way to have all of those charges dropped. Now, uh, have, you ever, have you ever wondered, why did Jesus have to come to earth to die? Why couldn't he have, a, why couldn't he have been crucified in heaven? Why did he have to come down here? Okay, and let's talk about this just for a minute. In the Old Testament and even in the New Testament in the, in the temple, the courtyard of the temple was patterned. And the closer you got to the Holy of Holies, there was a, there was a series of uh, boundaries. Okay? There was the gate, there was the court of the Gentiles, court of the women, court of the men. And so it just, it, it kind of drew things down a little as you got closer to the Holy of Holies. And where, where did the sacrifices always have to be slaughtered? On the altar. Okay? Why couldn't they take this sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and do it there? Because no sin could enter the Holy of Holies. Sin had to be paid for at the altar, outside the Holy of Holies. That's where all of this had to take place. Now, what took place in the Holy of Holies? Forgiveness, the cleansing, the purifying, the washing. That's what the, that's what the priest did when he took the blood of the lamb and sprinkled it seven times, number of perfection, on the lid of the mercy seat. And in the New Testament, the word mercy seat is the word propitiation, and it means place of satisfaction. And so when God saw the high priest sprinkle the blood with a little hyssop bush limb um, seven times, the sin of Israel was forgiven for that year. And it, that's, that's what it took. Uh, then it started over. So they had to do this year after year after year. All right, now, in heaven, the actual Holy of Holies exists in heaven. There is a, there's a temple in heaven. The Holy of Holies is in heaven, after which was patterned the one in the tabernacle. This is what, and, and the Lord showed this to Moses. So the actual Holy of Holies was in heaven. So there could not be, there could not be sin in the, the Holy of Holies because what, what did Jesus become? Sin. God made him sin. And so he had to be sacrificed outside just like the animals had to be sacrificed outside. They couldn't go in the Holy of Holies and just do it all at once. And so Christ was sacrificed outside. Earth is outside of heaven. And you're right. He had to become human because that was the species of life that needed release from their sin. It wasn't the animal kingdom. Animals don't have a sin nature. We do. And so Christ came and he died in our place, in essence, <clears throat> he suffered everything that sin brought into the human race. He did that, not only on the cross, but when he died, <clears throat> the Bible says that he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, or the middle of the earth. And did he go to hell? Yes, he did. And this is, this is almost even kind of hard to speak He was a lost man for three days. Why, why do people go to hell? Because of what? They're lost. He took our place in our lostness. 
He took our place in our sin. He became what we were. He suffered what we should have suffered. Now, for the human species, that's the end of it. There's never any recovery from that. But we're talking about the lamb. After three days, the Bible says he just simply got up, walked out of the tomb, washed his hands of everything death brought to the human race, and offered it down. This is yours. He didn't need to do that because he did not have any personal sin. And we've talked about this before. He was not a sinner. He was worse than that. He was sin itself. And so when he came out of the grave, sin stayed in the grave. And so here we are. Uh, the Lord, Jehovah, if that's the way that's pronounced, and we, the, the Tetragrammaton, that we've, we've lost the definition or, or rather the, the pronunciation of that throughout history. But this is the God that we're talking about. This is his personal name. Uh, and this is a stupid illustration, but I'm going to use it anyway. If you could see his driver's license, the name on his driver's license would be Y H W H. Was that, how do you pronounce that? Have no clue. <laughs> have no clue. That's his personal name. Uh, it, it would not have, you know, I'm the God who sees you. Uh, this wouldn't, wouldn't have that. It would have this name. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> which, which means your belief in me doesn't change what I am. I am, I have always been exactly what I am right now, and I'll never change. Everything. And he's the only God that ever claims that. When your heart's broken, he's the healer of your broken heart. Uh, when you're sick, he's the healer of your body. I mean, he, he literally, there can be no need in existence that God is not supply for. And so, well, that's just preaching. Yeah, you're right. That's preaching the truth. That's exactly what this means. And so, but look at, look at where people go. To find the things. Um, everybody worships somebody. Everybody. And in Israel, they started worshiping the Baals. B-A-A-L-S. Right? That wasn't just one God named Baal. It was, a, it was a family of gods. And they got this. Egypt was eaten up with it. And then when they came into the promised land, the Edomites... Uh, the Jebusites, all of the ites, all of them, worshipped basically the same family of gods. Had different names, but they worshipped the same thing. All right, now, if you find the thing that you think gives you your purpose and your joy in life, that's your Baal. In other words, that's, that's modern idolatry. If I look to anything, if I look to my family to bring me all the joy, all the happiness, all the fulfillment I ever need in life, my family becomes my bail. If I look to my money, if I look to my position, if, if I look to my intelligence, if I look to anything, that becomes my bail. Because I'm looking to that to provide what only God himself can provide. And so, does the Lord provide? That's what his name means. Jehovah, Yireh, the Lord will provide. And that's exactly what he did on this very spot. And I don't think Abraham knew that Jesus was going to be crucified on that hill. I seriously doubt he knew that. And it, it didn't happen anytime soon. It happened many, many, many generations later that this was where the Son of God offered himself as Jim Harris, Lorraine Braddock, Charlotte Braddock. All of us. He, he, he took our name. He took our identity. He took our sin. And God allowed that to happen. And then when all of the sin of the world was accumulated on his son, Jesus surrendered his life. And so, uh, does that sound too good to be true? It really does. But that's the truth. And that's why it is the seminal event in human history. 
Calvary. The cross of Jesus Christ where he was crucified is the seminal event in human history. And so earth is the courtyard. The, the Calvary was the place of bitterness, Mount Moriah. And so in the life of Jesus, this was, this was, a, this was a bitter thing. And remember what he said in the garden? Lord, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But it, it could not pass from him. And that was, that was the humanity of Jesus speaking. And he drank the bitterness of our sin, drank it. And, and it, it, just, it consumed him. It, it killed him. And so, but in the death of our Savior, that was temporary, was the death of Satan. His power, his authority, all of that was taken from him. It was like a serpent bit the Lord, emptied all of the venom that he would ever have into the Son of God, and that still didn't do the job. Because three days later, he rose. And so now there is, uh, Satan has no authority, none whatsoever. This is, this is done, and when Jesus said on the cross, Tetelestai, that was, a, that was a Greek translation of a phrase when, when uh, a Greek city, for instance, went to battle. And let's say they were 100 miles away, and they won the battle. They would send a runner back to their hometown. And as he, as he came into the city, he would begin to scream, Tetelestai, Tetelestai. And everybody would throw their hat in the air and begin to cheer and celebrate and hoop and holler because the phrase tetelestai means the enemy has been defeated without a chance of recovery. What did Jesus say on the cross? The enemy has been defeated without a chance of recovery. Do not fear Satan. He has no venom in his venom glands. It's all gone. Now, does he bluster? You know, does he swell up? You know, does he look real, you know? Yeah, he does. And, and, and what he looks like, we give him credit, you know, for being this very powerful. He's not. He knows it. And it's something that, that we need to come to grips with ourselves. And uh, so in the mercy seat, on the mercy seat in heaven, at the resurrection, do you remember the woman that came to him? And she didn't recognize him at first because he was in a glorified body. And she, she was going to touch him when she, she heard his voice. And she fell down and he said, don't touch me. As of yet, I have not ascended to my father. Why would he need to ascend to the father? He was going to ascend a few weeks later in Galilee. But he said, I haven't gone to my father yet. What did he have to do? Why did he have to ascend at that moment? Into the Holy of Holies is where he went. What do you think he did there? He sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat. And when that happened, God the Father banged the gavel of the universe. And he said, it is finished. No more sin account will ever be held against those that call on the name of my son. Your charges were dropped. My charges were dropped the very moment we accepted Christ as our Savior. And then he came back and, and what, for a few weeks, uh, walked among us, and, and we saw him. And, and uh, so this is, this is his name. So, I, and, and again, I don't know how to pronounce it. All I know is that there are four vowels, or, or rather four consonants, Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce that? We can't speak without vowels. We can't write without vowels. What are the vowels? And sometimes why? And I never figured that one out. But you know, and and there's you know, e before i, i before e, and I never I never understood all that stuff either. But uh, there are no vowels in the Hebrew language, and how how you pronounce that, I don't know. But I'm just going to call him Jehovah, because God knows, He knows who we're talking to, you know. And he knows the limitations of our intelligence. He knows the limitations of our comprehension of these things like this. And so uh, from that day to this, he is still the I am. I am exactly what I've always been. He has, and, but look how we change. 
we were at the restaurant a little bit ago, and uh, Lynn Rebel, yeah, Lynn Rebel went there, and Lynn's a buddy of mine, and he's he's kind of a smart aleck, and I like that. He came up to me and we shook hands. And he said, "You." You look a little bolder than you did the last time I saw you. <laughs> and we, we talked about that for a second. He went and sat down. And I was like, 20 years ago. Right? We, told, we had, well, I didn't have dark hair, but I, I had blonde hair. Jamie, I've got pictures. Of, yeah, I've got, I've got pictures of Jamie. We've got a head full of black hair. And... Uh, and so we change. You can, if you went to a class reunion today, everybody in here, probably with the exception of Chelsea, uh, they would be so old and bald they wouldn't recognize us. And, but God, oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And yes, yes, and Rose, and Anna, yeah, well, she's. She's in the tech booth. I, I left her out. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So. When you're, next time you get down about something, just say, Lord God, Jehovah, I don't even know what I need. I don't know. You know more about me than I do. And he can, he can be. And when people lose a family member, you know, my prayer for them and in my conversation with them, I pray the Lord will become what you've lost. I, I pray that the Lord will become a husband to Betty. Become a son to that mom and that dad. Become, you know, a, a wife to that husband. Whatever, whatever relationship you lose, God can be that. He became my dad. He became my mother. He will not leave you with a hole in your heart. That is not... The God who provides. That's not him. All right. Thank you all for being. Anybody have testimony about anything before we get going? All right. Sunday. Uh, Oh, wow. Okay, let's do that. Good to see y'all. Thank y'all for being here. And uh... okay. All right.
Really? Who gave you permission to leave the state of Florida? Y'all be careful. All right. We'll be praying for a safe trip there and back. All right, now, uh, Sunday, we've got uh, lunch after church, and um, hope you'll be here for that. So we'll be here at 9.45 and then 10.30 for the morning service and lunch, and we'll be back that night at uh, 6 o'clock. All right? Y'all are a good-looking crowd. You know that. Gordon, you don't look like you believe me. What? <laughs> he, he looked at me like a calf at a new gate. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, well, let's pray, and uh, I'll let you go. Father, we bow tonight to recognize that you and you alone are the provider of the needs of our heart. There is nothing. There is nothing that can ever cross our path that creates a hole in our very existence that you cannot fill, that you cannot meet the need of. It's impossible. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness. Thank you, Lord, for loving us the way you do. And I pray that you would bless and be what is needed in every prayer request, need that has been mentioned tonight. Fill that need with your very presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh.